In a street of Venice, Antonio, a royal Venetian merchant, hangs out with his friends Salarino and Salanio. He tells his friends that he is sad, but does not know the reason. Despite cheering him up, his friends suggest that he is worried about his commercial investments in trade trips that are dispatched to various ports. Antonio disagrees with them, stating that his business does not depend on a single venture. He has diversified his assets, so even if a single ship sinks, it will not affect his fortune. Your mind is tossing on the ocean. There, where your Argo sees with portly sail, like seniors and rich burghers on the flood, or, as it were, the pageants of the sea, do overpeer the petty traffickers that curtsy to them, do them reverence, as they fly by them with their woven wings. Believe me, no. I thank my fortune for it. My ventures are not in one bottom trusted, nor to one place, nor is my whole estate upon the fortune of this present year. Therefore, my merchandise makes me not sad. Solano teases Antonio, saying, that is the case, he must have surely fallen in love. Antonio dismisses this too. Why, then you are in love. Fie, fie. Not in love, neither. Then let us say you are sad. Because you are not merry, and twere as easy for you to laugh and leap, and say you are merry, because you are not sad. As the gossip continues, Bassanio, Antonio's friend, along with Lorenzo and Graciano, enter the scene. Here comes Bassanio, your most noble kinsman. Graciano and Lorenzo, fare ye well. We leave you now with better company. I would have stayed till I had made you merry, if worthier friends had not prevented me. Your worth is very dear in my regard. I take it your business calls on you, and you embrace the occasion to depart. Good morrow, my good lords. Good signors both, when shall we laugh? Say, when? You grow exceeding strange. Must it be so? We'll make our leisures to attend on yours. Salarino and Solano bid farewell to Antonio and depart. Graciano, being witty and outspoken, notices Antonio's despondency and states that some men who are quiet and sad-looking seem thoughtful. He asks Antonio not to worry about his business all the time. You look not well, Signor Antonio. You have too much respect upon the world. They lose it that do buy it with much care. Believe me, you are marvelously changed. I hold the world, but as the world, Graciano. A stage where every man must play a part, and mine is a sad one. Graciano adds that if Antonio chooses the melancholic part, he prefers the role of a comedian and spreads laughter by merrymaking. Later, he and Lorenzo take his leave. Bassanio stays back with Antonio. Bassanio <laughs> mocks Graciano, saying that he speaks an infinite deal of nonsense. Graciano speaks an infinite deal of nothing, more than any man in all Venice. His reasons are as two grains of wheat hid in two bushels of chaff. You shall seek all day ere you find them, and when you have them, they are not worth the search. Antonio asks Bassanio about his secret pilgrimage. Well, tell me now, what lady is the same to whom you swore a secret pilgrimage that you today promised to tell me of? Tis not unknown to you, Antonio, how much I have disabled mine estate by something showing a more swelling port than my fate means would grant continuance. Bassanio, a nobleman, leads an extravagant life beyond his means. He is in debt and wishes that Antonio offers him some financial help. Antonio, being a true friend, always helps him. Bassanio has a plan to clear all the debts. According
and their marriage would easily clear all his debts. Oh, my Antonio, had I but the means to hold a rival place with one of them, I have a mind presages me such thrift that I should questionless be fortunate. Antonio understands Bassanio's predicament, but he has a problem of his own. All the capital which he possesses is invested in his ships. Presently, he is unable to help him either with cash or commodity. Antonio suggests that Bassanio could try to get some money through credit using his good name. If he is successful in getting the money on credit, he would easily be able to reach Belmont in proper style. Thou knowest that all my fortunes are at sea. Neither have I money nor commodity to raise a present sum. Therefore, go forth, try what my credit can in Venice do, that shall be racked even to the uttermost, to furnish thee to Belmont, to fair Portia. The scene opens in Belmont, where Portia, the rich and beautiful heiress, resides. She is tired of meeting her suitors and complains about it to Nerissa, a lady-in-waiting. Nerissa agrees with her and says, being rich doesn't exempt one from problems. She has become a close friend to Portia since the death of her father. Both are of the same age and have a similar sense of humor. By my troth, Nerissa, my little body is aweary of this great world. You would be, sweet madam, if your miseries were in the same abundance as your good fortunes are. And yet, for aught I see, they are as sick that surfeit, with too much as they that starve with nothing. Nerissa says that people who are rich suffer the same as people who have nothing. A wealthy person gets old as soon as one who has just enough. Good sentences and well pronounced. They would be better if well followed. Portia retorts that it's always very easy to give advice than take it. If doing good deeds were as easy as knowing how to do them, then everyone would be better off. If to do were as easy as to know what were good to do, chapels had been churches, and poor men's cottages, princes' palaces. According to Portia, the brain can tell the heart what is to be done, but it does not make any difference in her case. Young people never like the advice of their elders. A dead father's will does not allow her to choose a husband of her choice. Being an obedient and loving daughter, she cannot choose the one she likes or reject the one whom she dislikes. But this reasoning is not in the fashion to choose me a husband. O oh, me, the word choose. I may neither choose whom I would nor refuse, whom I dislike. Portia's father was a virtuous and holy man. On his deathbed, he got an idea to conduct a game with three boxes or caskets to be chosen by his daughter's suitors. The suitor who figures out the correct casket out of the three gold, silver and lead box will solve the riddle and marry Portia. Nerissa says that a wrong suitor can never choose the right casket. Your father was ever virtuous and holy men at their death have good inspirations. Therefore the lottery that he hath devised in these three chests of gold silver and lead, whereof who chooses his meaning chooses you, will, no doubt, never be chosen by any rightly but one who shall rightly love. <laughs> they break into a fit of giggles. Portia asks Nerissa to take the names of each suitor one by one, and she would tell how she feels about them. First, there is the Neapolitan prince. Hey, that's a colt indeed, for he doth nothing but talk of his horse. Portia feels 
that the Neapolitan prince knew only one thing, and that was to talk about his horse. He praised himself for being able to shoe the horse. Portia remarks that she could only think that his mother must have had an affair with a blacksmith. Then there is the county paladin. He doth nothing but frown, as who should say, if you will not have me choose, he hears merry tales and smiles not. Next is the county palatine. He does nothing but frown. Even if he listens to a funny story, he never smiles. Portia feels that at such a young age, if he is so sad and solemn, his old age would be miserable. She would happily marry a skull rather than marrying him. Speaking about the French lord, Monsieur Le Bon, Portia remarks, God made him and therefore let him pass for a man. Making an exaggerated effeminate gesture with her hands, Portia says that he should first pass for being a man. He has a horse better than that of Neapolitans. He frowns better than County Palatine. He starts dancing when the bird sings. Portia continues, that if she marries him, she would have twenty husbands, because he is equal to twenty men all rolled in one. What say you then to Falconbridge, the young baron of England? You know I say nothing to him, for he understands not me, nor I him. Portia remarks about Falconbridge, the English baron, that she has no opinion about him, because she never understands what he speaks. He didn't speak Latin, French, or Italian. She has very little knowledge of English. Though he is handsome, she cannot marry a person who does not speak a language that she understands. What think you of the Scottish lord, his neighbor? That he hath a neighborly charity in him, for he borrowed a box of the ear of the Englishman and swore he would pay him again when he was able. Portia thinks that the Scottish lord is very forgiving by nature. He let the Englishman slap him on the ear without hitting him back. Being humble, he just threatens the Englishman to pay him back later. Speaking about the Duke of Saxony's nephew, Portia comments that he is awful in the morning when he is sober. He turns worse in the afternoon when he drinks. At his best, he is a little less than a man and, at his worst, he is little more than an animal. At this, Nerissa questions that if he is offered to play the game and he chooses the right casket, Portia will have to go against her father's will to refuse his proposal for marriage. Therefore, for fear of the worst, I pray thee, set a deep glass of Rhenish wine on the contrary casket. For if the devil be within and that temptation without, I know he will choose it. In order to avoid the worst situation, Portia suggests keeping a glass of Rhine wine in the wrong casket so that the Duke chooses it due to its smell. Portia is ready to do anything but marry a drunkard. However, she insists that she would never marry against her father's will, even if she would die old as a virgin, like Diana. If I live to be as old as Sibylla, I will die as chaste as Diana, unless I be obtained by the manner of my father's will. Nerissa tries to change Portia's mood by posing a question, if she recalls a Venetian scholar and a soldier who came with the Marquis of Montferrat to meet her father. Portia instantly remembers his name as Bassanio. Nerissa adds that he seems to be the most deserving match for a beautiful lady like Portia. A servant interrupts their talk and informs them that the four suitors are waiting to take her leave, and a messenger has come with the news that the Prince of Morocco will be arriving that night as the fifth suitor. If I could bid the fifth welcome with so good a heart as I can bid the other four farewell, 
I should be glad of his approach. As Portia leaves along with Nerissa, she comments that if he is as good as a saint but is black like a devil, she would prefer not to be his wife. As she heads off to greet the Moroccan prince, she complains that as soon as one suitor leaves, another follows quickly to take his place. Portia regrets her life to be so hard. The scene begins with the arrival of the Prince of Morocco, one of the suitors of Portia in Belmont. He arrives with four of his servants at Portia's house, seeking her hand in marriage. He meets Portia and asks her not to dislike him because of his dark complexion. Mislike me not for my complexion. The shadowed livery of the burnished sun to whom I am a neighbor and near bred. Morocco says that though his skin color is dark, his blood is red and his love is true like any fair suitor. He wouldn't trade his skin color except to make her think of him. Portia tells him that being good looking isn't the only way to win her heart. She has other criteria for choosing her husband. In terms of choice, I'm not solely led by nice direction of a maiden's eyes. Besides, the lottery of my destiny bars me the right of voluntary choosing. Portia conveys to Morocco that a lottery of her destiny was devised according to her father's will. Accordingly, out of the three caskets made of gold, silver and lead, each suitor has to choose the casket with Portia's portrait. The one who chooses the correct casket wins her hand in marriage. This lottery prevents Portia from exercising her freedom to choose. Prince of Morocco becomes enthusiastic and wishes to try his luck and choose a casket. He starts talking about his valor. Even for that, I thank you. Therefore, I pray you, lead me to the caskets to try my fortune. By this scimitar that slew the Sophi and the Persian prince that won three fields of Sultan Suleiman. He says that the Shah of Persia and the Persian prince were killed by him. He had defeated the Sultan Suleiman three times. He says that he is braver than the bravest man on earth. He can easily grab a bear cub from its mother or tease a hungry lion in order to win Portia's love. Portia confirms that all his bravado does not matter because rules are rules and he can only win Portia by choosing the right casket. You must take your chance and either not attempt to choose at all or swear before you choose if you choose wrong. Never to speak to lady afterward. In way of marriage, therefore be advised. She further reveals that her father has also placed a condition that if any of the suitors chooses the wrong casket, he would not only lose Portia, but he would also lose the chance to marry any other woman. The Prince of Morocco is ready for the consequences and insists on trying his luck. Portia asks him to have dinner and then choose a casket. The Merchant of Venice, Act 2, Scene 2 Act 2, Scene 2 takes place in Belmont. Lancelot Gobo, Shylock's servant, slowly opens the front door of his master's house and prepares to run away. He desires to quit his job. He struggles to decide whether to leave or stay as a servant to Shylock. Certainly, my conscience would serve me to run from this Jew, my master. The fiend is at mine elbow and tempts me, saying to me, Gobo, Lancelot Gobo, 
good Lancelot, oh good Gobo, oh good Lancelot Gobo, use your legs, take the start, run away. Just then, Lancelot's father, old Gobo, who is sand blind, enters the scene. He sees a blur image of a man and asks him to guide him through Shylock's house. Lancelot hides his identity and plays a prank on his father. He gives confusing directions to him. Master young gentleman, I pray you, which is the way to Master Jews? Turn up on your right hand at the next turning, but at the next turning of all, on your left, marry. At the very next turning, turn of no hand, but turn down indirectly to the Jew's house. When the old man inquires about his son Lancelot, he gives him a wrong report that he is dead. Old Gobo is shocked to hear that his son is no more. He mourns that his son had promised to support him in his old age. At this, Lancelot kneels down and receives his father's blessings and reveals his true identity. Do you not know me, father? Alack, sir, I am sand blind. I know you not. Nay, indeed, if you had your eyes, you might fail of the knowing me. It is a wise father that knows his own child. Well, old man, I will tell you news of your son. Give me your blessing. Old Gobbo believes Lancelot to be his son only after he takes his mother's name. I cannot think you are my son. I know not what I shall think of that. But I am Lancelot, the Jew's man, and I am sure Marjorie, your wife, is my mother. Her name is Marjorie, indeed. I'll be sworn, if thou be Lancelot, thou art mine own flesh and blood. Old Gobbo has brought Shylock a present. Lancelot suggests that the present be given to Bassanio, his newly chosen master. As Shylock's servant, he is not paid enough to eat properly. He has become so thin that his ribs can be counted. So he plans to run away and join Bassanio's service. Well, well, but for mine own part, as I have set up my rest to run away, so I will not rest till I have run some ground. My master's a very Jew. Give him a present. Give him a halter. I am famished in his service. You may tell every finger I have with my ribs. Bassanio enters the scene along with Leonardo and other followers. He gives instructions to his attendants to prepare for supper. He has invited his friends to celebrate his departure for Belmont, where he will begin his courtship of Portia. Lancelot urges his father to talk to Bassanio regarding his job. Here's my son, sir, a poor boy. Not a poor boy, sir, but the rich Jew's man. That would, sir, as my father shall specify. He hath a great infection, sir, as one would say, to serve. Old Gobbo persuades Bassanio to hire his son as his servant, as he does not want to be the servant of Shylock any more. Finally, Bassanio approves Lancelot to be his servant if he wishes to. He asks them to take leave from Shylock and reach his house. However, he reminds Lancelot that he will be leaving a rich Jew to serve a poor gentleman. Lancelot replies that Bassanio has the grace of God. He orders his attendant to give the best uniform to Lancelot. I know thee well. Thou hast obtained thy suit. Shylock, thy master, spoke with me this day, and hath preferred thee, if it be preferment, to leave a rich Jew's service, to become the follower of so poor a gentleman. Lancelot is very happy, and feels fortunate to work for Bassanio. Old Gobbo and Lancelot leave the place. Graciano enters the scene. He requests Bassanio to take him to Belmont along with him. He agrees on the condition that he will not open his mouth unnecessarily. Why then, you must, but hear thee, Graciano. Thou art too wild, too rude, and bold of voice. Parts that become thee happily enough, and in such eyes as ours appear not false. 
but where thou art not known, why, there they show something too liberal. Graciano promises to look solemn and behave modestly and not do anything which might ruin Bassanio's chance of winning Portia. Act 2, Scene 3 begins at Shylock's house. Jessica, Shylock's daughter, meets Lancelot in her house and expresses her sorrow as he plans to leave her father's service for Bassanio. Giving Lancelot a gold coin, she instructs him to secretly take a letter to her lover Lorenzo, who should be at Bassanio's house for dinner that night. I'm sorry thou wilt leave my father so. Our house is hell, and thou a merry devil. Did rob it of some taste of tediousness. Lancelot bids goodbye to Jessica. He calls her a sweet Jew, and hides his tears when he departs from Shylock's home. Adieu, tears exhibit my tongue. Most beautiful pagan, most sweet Jew. If a Christian did not play the knave and get thee, I am much deceived. But adieu, these foolish drops do sometimes drown my manly spirit. Adieu. Lancelot leaves. And Jessica thinks about her relationship with her father. Despite being a rebellious daughter, she feels guilty about the fact that she is ashamed of being Shylock's daughter. Though she shares her father's blood, she has not inherited his wickedness. She hopes to put an end to all her troubles by becoming Lorenzo's wife and converting to Christianity. Farewell, good Launcelot. Alack, what heinous sin is it in me to be ashamed to be my father's child. But though I'm a daughter to his blood, I'm not to his manners. O oh, Lorenzo, if thou keep promise, I shall end this strife, become a Christian and thy loving wife. Act 2, Scene 4 begins with Graciano, Lorenzo, Salarino and Salagno meeting in a street of Venice. They discuss about their plan to disguise themselves for the masquerade party to be held at Bassanio's house that evening. Salarino points out that they don't have torchbearers. Nay, we will slink away in supper time. Disguise us at my lodging and return, all in an hour. We have not made good preparation. We have not spoke us yet of torchbearers. Launcelot arrives and hands over the letter given by Jessica to Lorenzo. Lorenzo is mesmerized by the handwriting which he recognizes to be that of Jessica. Friend Launcelot, what's the news? And it shall please you to break up this, it shall seem to signify. I know the hand, in faith, tis a fair hand, and whiter than the paper it writ on is the fair hand that writ. Love news in faith. Hearing that Launcelot is going to invite Shylock to dine with Bassanio, Lorenzo gives him a ducat to secretly deliver a message to Jessica that he would not betray her. The friends agree to meet at Graciano's house to prepare for the masquerade party. Launcelot exits first, followed by Salario and Salagno. When all are gone, Graciano questions Lorenzo if the letter was from Jessica. Lorenzo decides to reveal his plan of eloping with Jessica to Graciano. According to Lorenzo, Jessica is a noble soul, and if at all Shylock goes to heaven, it will be because of Jessica. Lorenzo gives him Jessica's letter and tells him that Jessica will be his torchbearer for the masquerade. I must tell thee all. She had directed how I shall take her from her father's house, what gold and jewels she is furnished with, what pages suit she hath in readiness. If ere the Jew her father come to heaven, it will be for his gentle daughter's sake, and never dare misfortune cross her foot, unless she do it under this excuse, that she is issue 
to a faithless Jew. Come, go with me, peruse this as thou goest. Fair Jessica shall be my torchbearer. Launcelot reaches Shylock's residence and invites him for dinner at Bassanio's place. Though unwilling, Shylock decides to accept the invitation. Shylock warns Launcelot that Bassanio will not be as lenient a master as Shylock himself has been. He taunts Launcelot that he enjoyed his liberty to overeat and oversleep. In between the conversation, he calls aloud to his daughter, Jessica. Well, thou shalt see. Thy eyes shall be thy judge. The difference of old Shylock and Bassanio. What, Jessica? Thou shalt not gormandize, as thou hast done with me. What, Jessica? And sleep and snore and rend apparel out. Why, Jessica, I say. Why, Jessica? Who bids thee call? I do not bid thee call. Jessica enters, and Shylock asks her to lock the doors and windows and stay indoors. Call you? What is your will? I am bid forth to supper, Jessica. There are my keys. But wherefore should I go? I am not bid for love. They flatter me. He fears that something bad is about to happen, since he dreamt about money bags supposedly a bad omen. Jessica listens to her father. He warns her not to put her head outside the window or let any foolish merriment get into his house. As he leaves, Lancelot whispers to Jessica to watch for her lover Lorenzo among the revelers in the street. I will go before, sir. Mistress, look out at the window for all this. There will come a Christian boy, will be worth a Jewess's eye. Shylock asks Jessica about her furtive conversation with Launcelot. Jessica replies that he only bid her farewell. Shylock remarks that though Launcelot is kind, he eats and sleeps too much to be an efficient servant. What says that fool of Hagar's offspring, huh? His words were, farewell, mistress. Nothing else. The patch is kind enough, but a huge feeder. Snail slow in profit, and he sleeps by day. More than the wild cat, drones hive not with me. Therefore I part with him, and part with him to one that would have him help to waste his borrowed purse. As Shylock leaves to meet Bassanio, Jessica bids him farewell. And as she plans to elope with Lorenzo, she thinks that if nothing goes wrong, Shylock will soon lose a daughter, and she a father. Farewell, and if my fortune be not crossed, I have a father, you a daughter lost. opens with Mast, Graciano and Salarino waiting outside Shylock's house for Lorenzo. They are anxious because Lorenzo has not yet arrived. Salarino thinks that lovers tend to be early. Graciano compares love to a banquet. He says that once the lovers have had their fill of each other, their desire for each other slowly dwindles. According to him, the chase for love is the real fun. Oh, ten times faster Venus's pigeons fly to seal love's bonds new made than they are wont to keep obliged faith unforfeited. That ever holds who riseth from a feast with that keen appetite that he sits down. Where is the horse that doth untread again his tedious measures with the unbated fire 
that he did pace them first. All things that are, are with more spirit chased than enjoyed. Lorenzo joins his friends and apologizes for being tardy. He explains that his business ventures kept him busy. He promises that he would wait for the others in future if required. He calls for his lady love. Sweet friends, your patience for my long abode. Not I, but my affairs have made you wait. When you shall please to play the thieves for wives, I'll watch as long for you then. Approach, here dwells my father, Jew. Oh, who's within? Jessica appears on the balcony disguised as a boy. They exchange a few sweet words. Who are you? Tell me, for more certainty. Albeit, I'll swear that I do know your tongue. Lorenzo, and I love. Lorenzo, certain, and my love indeed. For who love I so much? And now, who knows but you, Lorenzo, whether I'm yours? Heaven and thy thoughts are witness that thou art. Jessica tosses him a casket of gold and jewels. She is ashamed of being dressed like a boy. Lorenzo says that she looks pretty even in her disguise and asks her to come down since she is supposed to act as his torchbearer. Catch this casket. It is worth the pains. I'm glad it's night. You do not look on me, for I am much ashamed of my exchange. But love is blind and lovers cannot see. The pretty follies that themselves commit. For if they could, Cupid himself would blush to see me thus transformed to a boy. Jessica finally comes downstairs and leaves with Lorenzo and Salerino. Graciano is left alone when Antonio enters the scene, wondering where all his friends have gone. He informs Graciano that there is a change in the plan, since Bassanio is leaving for Belmont that very night, and there is no masquerade party. Graciano is glad to join Bassanio and exit with Antonio. Fie, fie, Graciano! Where are all the rest? Tis nine o'clock, our friends all stay for you. No mask tonight, the wind is come about. Bassanio presently will go aboard. I have sent twenty out to seek for you. I'm glad on it. I desire no more delight than to be under sail and gone tonight. The Prince of Morocco is ready to play the game of the chests. Portia's musicians announce the arrival of the two parties. She enters with fanfare, side by side with the Prince of Morocco, their attendants following behind. Portia orders one of her servants to show the caskets to the prince. Go, draw aside the curtains and discover the several caskets to this noble prince. Now. Make your choice. The Prince of Morocco is ready to choose a casket out of the three gold, silver and lead caskets. He reads the inscriptions on the caskets and tries to interpret the meaning. The first of gold who this inscription bears. Who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. The second, silver, which this promise carries. Who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. This third, dull lead, with warning, is all blunt. Who chooseth me must give, and hazard all he hath. How shall I know if I do choose the right? After reading the inscriptions, he is confused, and asks Portia how he would know that he has chosen the right casket. Portia replies that one of the caskets contains her portrait. If he chooses the casket with her portrait, then she would be his wife. 
The one of them contains my picture, Prince. If you choose that, then I am yours with all. Morocco once again prepares himself to play the game and wishes that some god help him in choosing the right one. He reads the inscriptions carefully. The inscription on the lead casket reads, He who chooses me must give and risk all he has. The prince thinks that people risk everything hoping to make profit. So he decides not to choose the lead casket. The inscription on the silver casket declares that the one who chooses it will get what he deserves. The prince thinks that he deserves Portia in birth, fortunes, grace and stature. He loves only Portia and wants her to be his. What says the silver with her virgin hue? Who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. As much as he deserves. Pause there, Morocco, and weigh thy value with an even hand. If thou beest rated by thy estimation, thou dost deserve enough, and yet enough may not extend so far as to the lady. However, he is confused when he considers the inscription on the gold casket, which reads, He who chooses me will get what many men want. He thinks that it speaks about Portia, as she is the object of every man's desire. Let's see once more this saying graved in gold. Who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. Why, that's the lady. All the world desires her. From the four corners of the earth they come to kiss this shrine, this mortal breathing saint. Finally, the prince decides that lead is too worthless and silver is of less worth than gold. So, gold is the only thing worthy enough to hold Portia's picture. One of these three contains her heavenly picture. Is it like lead contains her? T'were damnation to think so base a thought. It were too gross to rib her seer cloth in the obscure grave. Or shall I think in silver she's immured, being ten times undervalued to tried gold? Oh, sinful thought! Never so rich a gem was set in worse than gold. When the prince opens the golden casket, he finds a skull and a scroll, beginning with the famous words, All that glitters is not gold, and you would have realized that if you were a bit wiser. The prince is condemned to a life of solitude. He leaves quickly with his attendants, as his heart is too heavy for a long leave-taking. Fare you well, your suit is cold, cold indeed, and labor lost. Then, farewell, heat, and welcome, frost. Portia, adieu. I have too grieved a heart to take a tedious leave. Thus, losers part. Portia waits until the prince leaves. She is delighted and wishes that all men with his complexion choose in the same manner. A gentle riddance, draw the curtains, go, let all of his complexion choose me so. Opens with Salarino and Salagno hanging around in a street in Venice. They talk about the latest developments in the city. Salarino says that Lorenzo has not accompanied Bassanio to Belmont. Why, man, I saw Bassanio under sail. With him is Graciano gone along. And in their ship, I am sure, Lorenzo is not. Salagno says that Shylock complained to the Duke of Venice 
when he found that his daughter had disappeared. They searched Bassanio's ship, but couldn't find Jessica and Lorenzo. Later, the Duke learned that Lorenzo and Jessica eloped in a gondola. The villain Jew, with outcries, raised the Duke, who went with him to search Bassanio's ship. He came too late. The ship was under sail. But there the Duke was given to understand that in a gondola were seen together Lorenzo and his amorous Jessica. Salanio makes fun of Shylock, describing how he lamented in the street, saying he had lost his daughter to a Christian, along with money, gold, and precious stones. Even the boys in the street made fun of him. They followed him yelling, His stones, his daughter, and his ducats. My daughter, oh my ducats, oh my daughter, fled with a Christian. Oh, my Christian ducats, justice, the law, my ducats and my daughter. A sealed bag, two sealed bags of ducats, of double ducats, stolen from me by my daughter, and jewels, two stones, two rich and precious stones, stolen by my daughter, justice, find the girl, she had the stones upon her and the ducats. Salanio says that Antonio should repay the debt to Shylock on time, otherwise he would take revenge for the loss of his daughter and money. Salarino informs that he has received bad news from a Frenchman, that an Italian ship loaded with treasure was wrecked in the English Channel. He prays that it is not Antonio's ships. Mary well remembered. I reasoned with a Frenchman yesterday, who told me, in the narrow seas that part the French and English, there miscarried a vessel of our country richly fraught. I thought upon Antonio when he told me, and wished in silence that it were not his. They wonder if they should communicate the news to Antonio. Salarino says that no gentleman on earth is as kind as Antonio. He recounts the emotional farewell given by Antonio to Bassanio, at the time of his departure to Belmont. Even there, his eye being big with tears, turning his face, he put his hand behind him, and with affection wondrous sensible, he wrung Bassanio's hand. And so they parted. They decide to meet Antonio and cheer him up. Both exit the scene. I think he only loves the world for him. I pray thee, let us go and find him out and quicken his embraced heaviness with some delight or other. Do we so? This scene opens up with the arrival of the next suitor for Portia. Trumpets play when the Prince of Aragon enters along with his entourage and Portia. He has come to try his hand at the casket game. Nerissa comes running into the room where the caskets are placed. The servants spring into action. Quick, quick, I pray thee, draw the curtain straight. The Prince of Aragon hath ta'en his oath and comes to his election presently. Portia invites the prince to choose a casket and reminds him the rules to be followed. If the prince chooses the casket that contains her picture, he can marry her immediately. If he fails, he has to leave immediately. Behold, there stand the caskets, noble prince. If you choose that wherein I am contained, straight shall our nuptial rites be solemnized. But if you fail, without more speech, my lord, you must be gone from hence immediately. Prince of Aragon lists the rules one by one. I am enjoined by oath to observe three things. First, never to unfold any one which casket twas I chose. Next, if I fail of the right casket, never in my life to woo a maid in way of marriage. Lastly, if I do fail in fortune of my choice, immediately to leave you and be gone. The prince then goes through a line of reasoning, like the Prince of Morocco. He says that the lead casket should have been more attractive for him to risk anything for it. He reads the inscription on the gold casket, which says, He who chooses me 
will get what many men desire. He rules out the gold casket as something that would only appeal to those deceived into valuing appearances more than actual value. And so have I addressed me, fortune now to my heart's hope, gold, silver, and base lead. Who chooseth me might give and hazard all he hath. You shall look fairer, ere I give or hazard. What says the golden chest? Ha! Let me see. Who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. What many men desire. That many may be meant by the full multitude that choose by show, not learning more than the fond eye doth teach. Prince of Aragon ponders a lot before choosing the right casket. Towards the end, he hems and haws about the silver casket's inscription, about getting what he deserves. He says, if people were better at judging what one deserves, some great men might be knocked down, and some poor men might rise up. He decides that he deserves Portia. Finally, he ends his task by choosing the silver casket. Well, but to my choice, who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. I will assume desert. Give me a key for this, and instantly unlock my fortunes here. Unfortunately, when he opens the silver casket, he finds a fool's head. He is disappointed by the wrong choice, and prepares to leave. What's here? The portrait of a blinking idiot presenting me a schedule? I will read it. How much unlike art thou to Portia? How much unlike my hopes and my deservings? Who chooseth me shall have as much as he deserves? Did I deserve no more than a fool's head? Is that my prize? Are my deserts no better? Portia and Nerissa are glad to see the Prince of Aragon leave. As he leaves, they comment on his bad luck. Thus had the candles signed the moth. Oh, these deliberate fools, when they do choose, they have the wisdom by their wit to lose. The ancient saying is no hearsay. Hanging and vying goes by destiny. Portia gets up to go. Come, draw the curtain, Nerissa. Just then, a messenger arrives to convey the message that a young Venetian has arrived with the news that his master will be arriving any moment. He has sent polite greetings and expensive gifts. The messenger praises that he has never seen such a promising suitor. Portia teases the messenger to be crazy in praising the Venetian gentleman. She rushes Nerissa out to take a look at the man playing Cupid for the Venetian gentleman. Nerissa hopes that the soon-to-arrive Venetian be Bassanio, the guy she and Portia like more than any other suitor. No more, I pray thee, I'm half afeard. Thou wilt say anon he is some kin to thee. Thou spend'st such high day wit in praising him. Come, come, Nerissa, for I long to see quick Cupid's post that comes so mannerly. Bersanio, Lord Love, if thy will it be. Salanio and Salarino meet in a street of Venice and reflect on the news that one more ship of Antonio that was carrying expensive cargo wrecked in the English Channel on the Goodwin Sands. According to rumors, many ships sank at the same place. Salanio wishes that the new rumor is a lie. Now, what news on the Rialto? Why, yet it lives there unchecked that Antonio hath a ship of rich lading wrecked on the narrow seas. The Goodwins, I think they call the place, a very dangerous, flat and fatal, where the carcass of many a tall ship lie buried, as they say, if my gossip report be an honest woman of her word. Hey, what sayest thou? Why, the end is he hath lost a ship. 
I would. It might prove the end of his losses. As they lament that Antonio's fortunes are poor, they're interrupted by Shylock. Salanio asks Shylock about the news in the market. Shylock blames them that they already knew that his daughter fled. Instead of consoling Shylock, Salanio and Salarino joke that they even know the tailor who stitched her clothes to disguise and flee. You know none so well, none so well as you, of my daughter's flight. That's certain. I, for my part, knew the tailor that made the wings she flew withal. And Shylock, for his part, knew the bird was fledged. And then it is the complexion of them all to leave the dam. She is damned for it. As Shylock laments that his own flesh and blood has deserted him, the other two men are insensitive. Salarino says that Jessica was never like Shylock. He says that there is greater difference between them than between coal and ivory. There is more difference between thy flesh and hers than between jet and ivory. More between your bloods than there is between red wine and Rhenish. But tell us, do you hear whether Antonio have had any loss at sea or no? The conversation shifts to Antonio. They ask Shylock about Antonio's lost ship and what he would do with a pound of Antonio's flesh. Shylock spews his venom on Antonio. He says that even if can't eat Antonio's flesh, it will feed his revenge. He lists the cruelties to which Antonio has subjected him simply because he is a Jew. To bait fish withal. If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million. Laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heated mine enemies. And what's his reason? I am a Jew. One of Antonio's servants arrives at the place to announce that Antonio would like to speak to Salanio and Salarino. As they leave, Tubal, a Jewish friend of Shylock, enters with his own news. Tubal returns from Genoa, where he had been looking for Jessica. He fails in finding her. How now, Tubal? What news from Genoa? Hast thou found my daughter? I often came where I did hear of her, but cannot find her. Shylock laments the loss of his daughter, the money she took, and the money he is spending on the fruitless search for her. He wishes that his daughter were dead and laid out in her coffin at his feet, with all the ducats inside it with her. Why, there, 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 a diamond gone cost me... Two thousand ducats in Frankfurt. The curse never fall upon our nation till now. I never felt it till now. Two thousand ducats in that and other precious, precious jewels. I would, my daughter were dead at my foot and the jewels in her ear. Tubal comforts Shylock by saying that other people too have bad luck. He further says that a third ship of Antonio was lost near Tripoli. Apparently, Antonio's Tripoli venture has failed and the man is practically ruined. He adds that he spoke to a few sailors who survived the wreck. Shylock is glad to hear about Antonio's misfortune and he profusely thanks God. Yes, other men have ill luck too, Antonio, as I heard in Genoa. What, what, what? Ill luck? Ill luck! Hath an Argosy cast away, coming from Tripolis? I thank God, I thank God! Is it true? Is it true? I spoke with some of the sailors that escaped the wreck. I thank thee, good Tubal. Good news, good news. <laughs> Where? In Genoa? Tubal adds fuel to the fire and conveys that Jessica 
had spent 80 ducats in one night. He says that Jessica traded her turquoise ring for a monkey. Shylock is pained. Hear how his daughter squanders his hard-earned money, and he curses her. There came divers of Antonio's creditors in my company to Venice that swear he cannot choose but break. I am very glad of it. I'll plague him. I'll torture him. I am glad of it. One of them showed me a ring that he had of your daughter for a monkey. Out upon her, thou torturest me, Tubal. It was my turquoise. I had it of Leah when I was a bachelor. I would not have given it for a wilderness of monkeys. Shylock is extremely delighted at Antonio's utter ruin. He sends Tubal off to get an officer of the law so that they can prepare for the rightful collection of Antonio's flesh at the forfeit. He gloats that with Antonio, business will be better for him in Venice. He tells Tubal to meet him later at the synagogue. But Antonio is certainly undone. Nay, that's true. That's very true. Go, Tubal. Fee me an officer. Bespeak him a fortnight before. I will have the heart of him if he forfeit. For were he out of Venice, I can make what merchandise I will. Go, go, Tubal, and meet me at our synagogue. Bassanio is all set to choose a casket. Portia wants Bassanio to wait a few days before he undertakes her father's challenge, fearing he might choose wrong and be forced to leave her. Portia pleads with him to take some more time before choosing the casket. Bassanio professes his love for Portia, and Portia is evidently in love with him. Even though a young woman is not allowed to speak her thoughts, she wishes that Bassanio stays with her for a month or two before choosing a casket. She wants to reveal the secret of the casket to him. But as she has taken the oath not to reveal the right casket, she is in a dilemma. I pray you tarry, pause a day or two, before you hazard, for in choosing wrong, I lose your company. Therefore forbear a while. There is something tells me, but it is not love. I would not lose you, and you know yourself. Hate counsels not in such a quality. She wishes she could teach Bassanio how to interpret the challenge, but that would be breaking her oath. Darn it. Bassanio says he wants to take the test immediately. He feels that all the waiting around is like being on the rack. Let me choose. For as I am, I live upon the rack. Upon the rack, Bassanio? Then confess, what treason there is mingled with your love? When Portia asks Bassanio about the treason he committed out of love, he says that he is guilty of some mistrust that makes him worry he may never be able to enjoy her love. Immediately he confesses that he loves her and prefers to choose the casket as soon as possible. None but that ugly treason of mistrust, which makes me fear the enjoying of my love. There may as well be amity and life between snow and fire as treason and my love. Eh, hey, but I fear you speak upon the rack. We are men enforced to speak anything. Promise me life and I'll confess the truth. Well then, confess and live. Confess and love had been the very sum of my confession. O oh, happy torment, when my torturer doth teach me answers for deliverance, but let me to my fortune and the caskets. They walk to the villa and to the room where the caskets are placed. 
Porsche orders everyone to back off so that Bassanio chooses the right casket in peace. She orders for music to be played befitting the occasion. If he loses, he will fade away in the music. And if he wins, the music should befit that of the coronation of a king. Away then, I am locked in one of them. If you do love me, you will find me out. Nerissa and the rest stand all aloof. Let music sound while he doth make his choice. She compares Bassanio to Hercules, Alcides, rescuing the virgin paid as tribute by Troy to a sea monster. She says that she herself is the sacrifice, and if Bassanio survives this test, then she will live again. Bassanio is ready to choose the casket with Portia's portrait. He begins by saying that the outward appearances might be deceiving. The whole world is tricked by fancy appearances. He philosophizes that the outer beauty is just the decoration which can hide the inner ugliness. Women who apply makeup look beautiful, but such women are least respected. So may the outward shows be least themselves. The world is still deceived with ornament. In law, what plea so tainted and corrupt, but being seasoned with a gracious voice? Similarly, curly golden hair looks very beautiful in the wind and makes a woman gorgeous. But one can buy that kind of hair as a wig, and wigs are made from dead people's hair. In religion, an error can be covered with a nice show of blessings. Every vice has some outward appearance of virtue. Obscure the show of evil? In religion, what damned error, but some sober brow will bless it and approve it with a text, hiding the grossness with fair ornament. There is no vice so simple, but assumes some mark of virtue on his outward parts. According to him, many cowards with disloyal hearts have beards like brave Hercules and Mars, the god of war, even though they have no guts and can be easily frightened. Think of beauty, which can be bought by the pound in the form of cosmetics, which work miraculously on nature, making the women the most beautiful. How many cowards whose hearts are all as false as stairs of sand where yet upon their chins the beards of Hercules and frowning Mars, who inward searched, have livers white as milk. Bassanio thinks that decoration is nothing but a danger meant to trick and trap the viewer. A lovely, cunning shore can distract a man from the perils of a stormy sea, just as a pretty scarf can hide a dangerous, dark-skinned beauty. He concludes that appearances are often deceiving, even to the wisest. He decides to leave the golden casket untouched. He also rejects the silver casket, because it is the metal from which the coins are made of. He approaches the lead casket, which he feels is a humble one. Though it looks too threatening to promise him anything good, it moves his heart. Finally, Bassanio chooses the lead casket and hopes for the best. Therefore, thou gaudy gold, hard food for Midas, I will none of thee, nor none of thee, thou pale and common drudge, tween man and man. But thou, thou meager lead, which rather threatenest than dost promise aught, thy plainness moves me more than eloquence, and here choose I joy, be the consequence. On seeing Bassanio making the right choice, Portia is overwhelmed with joy. All other emotions, doubt, despair, fear, and jealousy fly away. She tries to control her emotion and look normal. How all the other passions fleet to air, as doubtful thoughts and rash embrace despair and shuddering fear and greed-eyed jealousy. O oh, love, be moderate, allay thy ecstasy. In measure reign thy joy, scant this excess. I feel too much thy blessing, make it less, for fear I surfeit. 
Bassanya opens the lead casket and finds Portia's portrait along with a note which tells him to go ahead and kiss his new wife. He reads aloud the note. You that choose not by the view, chance as fair and choose as true. Since this fortune falls to you, be content and seek no new. If you well pleased with this, and hold your fortune for your bliss, turn to where your lady is, and claim her with a loving kiss. Bassanio is flabbergasted that he made the right choice. However, he does not want to kiss her without her permission. Hearing applause and universal shout, Gideon spirit, still gazing in a doubt, whether those peals of praise be his or no. So, thrice fair lady, stand I, even so, as doubtful whether what I see be true, until confirmed, signed, ratified by you. Portia wishes to be thousand times prettier and ten thousand times richer only for the sake of Bassanio. She thinks that Bassanio might value her more with her good qualities, beauty, possessions, and friends. She immediately accepts Bassanio and tells him that whatever she owns is his. She gives him a ring to signify their new union and says that if he loses it or gives it away, it's as good as ruining their love. Myself and what is mine to you and yours is now converted. But now I was the lord of this fair mansion, master of my servants, queen over myself, and even now, but now, this house, these servants, and the same myself are yours, my lords. I give them with this ring, which when you part from, lose or give away, let it presage the ruin of your love and be my vantage to exclaim on you. Bassanio is speechless. He says that he is confused, like the crowd of people who are going wild after hearing their prince give them a speech. He also assures Portia that if she sees him without the ring, she can be sure that he is no more. Where every something being blent together turns to a wild of nothing, save of joy, expressed and not expressed. But when this ring parts from this finger, then parts life from hence. Oh, then be bold to say, Bassanio's dead. Nerissa approaches to congratulate Portia and Bassanio. My lord and lady, it is now our time, that have stood by and seen our wishes prosper, to cry good joy. Good joy, my lord and lady. Graciano too joins to congratulate them and wishes that he too gets married at the same time when they get married. Bassanio agrees to it if he finds a wife by then. My lord Bassanio and my gentle lady, I wish you all the joy that you can wish, for I am sure you can wish none from me. And when your honors mean to solemnize the bargain of your faith, I do beseech you, even at that time, I may be married too. With all my heart, so thou canst get a wife. Graciano is thankful to Bassanio and reveals that he has already found his wife. He says that as soon as he saw Nerissa for the first time, he fell in love with her. Without any delay, he confessed his love to Nerissa. Finally, she accepted his love and was ready to get married once Bassanio and Portia get married. I thank your lordship. You have got me one. My eyes, my lord, can look as swift as yours. You saw the mistress. I beheld the maid. You loved, I loved. For intermission no more pertains to me, my lord, than you. Your fortune stood upon the caskets there. Bassanio feels honored to join them in their wedding. Just then, Lorenzo and Jessica, along with Salario, enter the scene. They receive a cordial welcome. Salario hands over a letter written by Antonio to Bassanio. As Bassanio reads the letter, Portia notices that Bassanio grows pale and horrified. She assumes that some dear friend of Bassanio might have died. 
She insists him to tell what was bothering him. There are some shrewd contents in yon same paper that steals the color from Bassanio's cheek. Some dear friend dead, else nothing in the world could turn so much the constitution of any constant man. What worse and worse would leave Bassanio? I'm half yourself, and I must freely have the half of anything that the same paper brings you. Bassanio confesses to Portia that he had told her that he was a wealthy man, but the truth is that all his money is borrowed from his friend Antonio. The letter contains the bad news that all of Antonio's ventures have failed. Salario interrupts, saying the situation is even worse. Even if Antonio had money to repay the debt, Shylock was adamant to get a pound of Antonio's flesh instead of the money. He says that he had never seen a greedy and inhuman man like Shylock. When I did first impart my love to you, I freely told you all the wealth I had ran in my veins. I was a gentleman, and then I told you true, and yet, dear lady. Rating myself at nothing, you shall see how much I was a braggart when I told you my state was nothing. I should then have told you that I was worse than nothing, for indeed. Jessica says that she had heard her father swearing to Tubal and Cush, who were his countrymen. He preferred to have Antonio's flesh rather than twenty times the sum Antonio owed. When I was with him, I have heard him swear to Dubal and to Cus, his countrymen, that he would rather have Antonio's flesh than twenty times the value of the sum that he did owe him. Portia asks Bassanio how much his friend Antonio owes to Shylock. Bassanio replies that Antonio, his dearest friend, is the kindest and the noblest soul in Italy. He owes three thousand ducats to Shylock. The dearest friend to me, the kindest man, the best conditioned and unwearied spirit, in doing courtesies and one in whom the ancient Roman honor more appears than any that draws breath in Italy. Portia is shocked to hear such a small amount and suggests giving six thousand ducats and finishing the debt. She is ready to pay even twelve thousand ducats for a noble friend like Antonio. What? No more. Pay him six thousand and deface the bond. Double six thousand and then treble that. Before a friend of this description shall lose a hair through Bassanio's fault, first go with me to church and call me wife, and then away to Venice to your friend. Bassanio continues reading the letter. Antonio explains that all his ships have been wrecked. His creditors were getting mean. And he almost ran out of money. He further adds that he was unable to pay the debt to the Jew, so he would certainly die when Shylock takes his flesh. Bassanio reads aloud Antonio's letter. Sweet Bassanio, my ships have all miscarried. My creditors grow cruel. My estate is very low. My bond to the Jew is forfeit, and since in paying it it is impossible I should live. All debts are cleared between you and I. If I might but see you at my death, notwithstanding, use your pleasure. If your love do not persuade you to come, let not my letter. Portia is touched deeply by Antonio's words. She pleads to Bassanio to leave everything and make his arrangements to leave for Venice immediately. Bassanio is happy that Portia understands the need. Of the hour, oh love, dispatch all business and be gone. Since I have your good leave to go away, I will make haste. But till I come again, no bed shall e'er be guilty of my stay. No rest be interposer twixt us twain. Antonio, accompanied by the jailer, 
meets Shylock in a street of Venice. He seeks a chance to try and reason with Shylock to see if they can come to an agreement before the case is heard by the Duke in the court. Shylock warns the jailer to keep an eye on Antonio and not to convince him to have mercy on Antonio. Shylock turns a deaf ear to Antonio's pleas. Shylock says that in the past, Antonio has called him a dog. Since he, a dog, Antonio should watch out for his teeth. He is confident that the Duke will grant him justice. He rebukes the jailer for permitting Antonio to come out of the jail. He makes it clear that he has the bond and he is determined to get what Antonio owes him as per the bond. Jailer, look to him. Tell not me of mercy. This is the fool that lent out money gratis. Jailer, look to him. Hear me yet, good Shylock. I have my bond. Speak not against my bond. I have sworn an oath that I will have my bond. Thou callst me dog before thou hadst a cause. But since I am a dog, beware my fangs. The duke shall grant me justice. I do wonder, thou naughty jailer, that thou art so fond to come abroad with him at his request. I pray thee, hear me speak. Antonio still pleads with Shylock to listen to him, but Shylock refuses. Shylock informs Antonio that he is going to get his bond right away. He doesn't want to be taken for a fool who sighs and gives in to Christian meddlers. He sternly tells Antonio not to follow him. He goes inside his house and slams the door. I have my bond. I will not hear thee speak. I have my bond and therefore speak no more. I'll not be made a soft and dull-eyed fool to shake the head, relent and sigh and yield to Christian intercessors. Follow not. I have no speaking. I will have my bond. Salarino is very angry at Shylock. He calls Shylock a stubborn dog who ever lived among humans. Antonio is aware that Shylock cannot be persuaded because he wants Antonio's death. In the past, Antonio had helped the people who were unable to pay back the loans to Shylock. This way, Antonio used to undercut Shylock's business all the time. Ultimately, this resulted in Shylock's hatred towards Antonio. Salarino is hopeful that the Duke will never allow such a ridiculous contract to be enforced. It is the most impenetrable cur that ever kept with men. Let him alone. I'll follow him no more with bootless prayers. He seeks my life. His reason well I know. I oft delivered from his forfeitures many that have at times made moan to me. Therefore he hates me. I am sure the Duke will never grant this forfeiture to hold. Antonio concludes that there's nothing he can do because the law is in Shylock's favor. The Duke cannot deny the law as the security of all foreign merchants of Venice might be in threat. The city makes its money depending on this law. Antonio prays that Bassanio comes to meet him before his death. The Duke cannot deny the course of law for the commodity that strangers have with us in Venice. If it be denied, will much impeach the justice of the state, since that the trade and profit of the city consisteth of all nations. Therefore go. These griefs and losses have so baited me that I shall hardly spare a pound of flesh tomorrow to my bloody creditor. Well, jailer, on. Pray God, Bassanio come to see me pay his debt, and then I care not. Portia, Nerissa, Lorenzo and Jessica enter with Balthazar, a servant of Portia. Lorenzo compliments Portia for her perfect understanding of the friendship between her husband and Antonio. He informs Portia that when she would come to know the greatness of Antonio, she would be even more proud and happy for Bassanio to have such a good friend. Madam, 
Although I speak it in your presence, you have a noble and a true conceit of godlike amity, which appears most strongly in bearing thus the absence of your Lord. But if you knew to whom you show this honor, how true a gentleman you send relief, how dear a lover of my Lord, your husband, I know you would be prouder of the work than customary bounty can enforce you. Portia responds that she never regrets doing good. She feels that if Antonio is worthy of Bassanio's friendship, he is well worth rescuing from hellish cruelty at any cost. Bassanio's best friend is like her best friend. Whatever she has done is very small in front of their friendship. She requests Lorenzo to take charge of her house until Bassanio's return. She announces that she will go to a monastery which is two miles away to pray and contemplate until their husband's return from Venice. Lorenzo wholeheartedly accepts the charge. Lorenzo, I commit into your hands the husbandry and manager of my house until my lord's return. For mine own part, I have toward heaven breath a secret vow to live in prayer and contemplation, only attended by Nerissa here. Until her husband and my lord's return, there is a monastery two miles off, and there will be abide. I do desire you not to deny this imposition, the which my love and some necessity now lays upon you. Before taking leave for the monastery, Portia informs Lorenzo that her servants will consider him and Jessica as their masters in her absence. Both Lorenzo and Jessica exit the scene. Portia gives instructions to her servant, Balthazar, to deliver a letter to her cousin, Bellario in Padua. Bellario is a doctor of laws. She instructs him to rush the documents and the clothes that Dr. Bellario sends with him to a ferry that goes to Venice. There, Portia and Nerissa will be waiting to meet him. No, Balthazar. As I have ever found the honest true, so let me find thee still. Take the same letter, and use thou all the endeavor of a man. In speed to Padua, see thou render this into my cousin's hands, Dr. Bellerio, and look what notes and garments he doth give thee. Bring them, I pray thee, with imagined speed, unto the traject to the common ferry which treats to Venice. Waste no time in words, but get thee gone. I shall be there before thee. Balthazar rushes to Padua with the orders. Portia calls Nerissa and informs that very soon they will see their husbands. Nerissa is delighted, though she is unaware of the plan. Portia discloses that they will be disguised as men. Portia is so sure that she would look more handsome than Nerissa. In her guise, she would hold her sword more gracefully, speak like a teenage boy, and walk with a manly stride. She plans to talk about fights of bragging youth and lie about ladies who fell in love with her and died when she rejected them. They shall, Nerissa, but in such a habit that they shall think we are accomplished. With that we lack, I'll hold thee any wager. When we are both accountered like young men, I'll prove the prettier fellow of the two, and wear my dagger with the braver grace." Nerissa is a bit confused with the plan, and asks Portia if they are going to be turned into men. Portia feels annoyed, and tells her that they have twenty miles to cover, and she will explain the plan in detail on the way. Act 3, Scene 5 begins at Belmont, in Portia's house, where Lancelot Gobbo talks to Jessica. Lancelot shows his concern towards Jessica, and says that it is true that children are punished for the sins of their fathers. He is worried for Jessica, because he thinks she might go to hell for the sins of Shylock. Lancelot tells her that she should hope that she is not the daughter of a Jew. Yes, truly. For look you, the sins of the father are to be laid upon the children, 
Therefore I promise you, I fear you. I will always plain with you, and so now I speak my agitation of the matter. Therefore be of good cheer, for truly I think you are damned. There is but one hope in it that can do you any good, and that is but a kind of bastard hope neither. Jessica counters Launcelot, saying, If that's true, she would be punished for her mother's sins of infidelity. Launcelot agrees that Jessica is damned either way, but she points out that she'll be saved by her husband, who will make her a Christian when he marries her. Launcelot points out at the trouble that there were already many Christians, and this will add one more to it. The number of pork eaters will also increase, resulting in hike of pork price. And what hope is that? I pray thee. Marry, you may partly hope that your father got you not, that you are not the Jew's daughter. So the sins of my mother should be visited upon me. Truly then, I fear you are damned both by father and mother. I shall be saved by my husband. He hath made me a Christian. The making of Christians will raise the price of hogs. If we grow all to be pork eaters, we shall not shortly have a rasher on the coals for money. In the meanwhile, Lorenzo enters and shows his concern over Launcelot being too cosy with Jessica. Lorenzo sternly speaks to Launcelot that any fool could make fun. I'll tell my husband, Launcelot, what you say. Here he comes. I shall grow jealous of you shortly, Launcelot, if you thus get my wife into corners. Nay, you need not fear us, Lorenzo. Launcelot and I are out. He tells me flatly, there is no mercy for me in heaven, because I am a Jew's daughter. Lorenzo is annoyed with the talks of Launcelot. He is surprised by his talent of twisting around words. He asks Launcelot to go and tell the servants to get ready for dinner. Goodly lord, what a wit snapper are you? Then bid them prepare dinner. That is done too, sir. Lorenzo asks Jessica what she thinks of Portia. Jessica is full of praises for Portia. She feels that Bassanio is very lucky and blessed to have Portia as his wife. Jessica replies that she finds Portia more perfect than she can express and compares her to a god or angel. Lorenzo is a little taken aback by Jessica's warm words, and he teases Jessica, saying, If Portia is a good wife to Bassanio, he is a worthy husband to Jessica. Jessica is delighted to hear that. She wishes to continue the conversation, but Lorenzo asks her to wait until dinner, because it would be easier for him to digest whatever praise she has to offer along with the meal. Past all expressing, it is very meet the Lord Bassanio live an upright life for having such a blessing in his lady. He finds the joys of heaven here on earth, and if on earth he do not merit it, in reason he should never come to heaven. Even such a husband hast thou of me as she is for a wife. Nay, but ask my opinion too of that. I will anon. First, let us go to dinner. Nay, let me praise you while I have a stomach. No, pray thee, let it serve for table talk. Then how some air thou speakest. Among other things I shall digest it. Well, I'll set you forth. The Duke begins the trial. He is an impartial judge, but at the same time he feels sorry for Antonio because Shylock is a merciless scalawag. Antonio is prepared to meet Shylock's fury with resignation. Shylock is called into the court. The Duke expects Shylock to show mercy on Antonio and forgive some part of his debt, since everyone knows of the crippling losses Antonio has endured. Shylock acts as his own lawyer. He says that he is sworn by the Jewish Holy Sabbath that he'll get what he's owed 
for Antonia's forfeiture of the bond. Further, if the city should fail to enforce Antonia's oath, their charter and their freedom will be called into question. What's more, he doesn't have to explain why he'd rather have a pound of Antonio's flesh than the 3,000 ducats. Bassanio pipes up to say that this doesn't excuse how cruel Shylock is being. He asks if all men kill what they hate. Shylock replies that hate's a pretty good motivator, since no one would kill something they didn't hate. Antonio cuts off their bickering and asks Bassanio not to argue with Shylock. He says that asking him why he's intent on killing Antonio is like asking a wolf why it would eat a lamb and make a mama sheep cry. Antonio claims that nothing is harder than the Jew's heart. It cannot be softened. He'd rather just get on with the trial and get his punishment over with. Bassanio offers 6,000 ducats instead of 3,000. Shylock refuses by saying, If every ducat in 6,000 ducats were in six parts, and every part a ducat, I would not draw them. I would have my bond. The Duke questions Shylock how he can expect mercy when he offers none. Shylock replies that he doesn't need mercy, since he hasn't done anything wrong. He brilliantly flips the script. He points out that there are many slave owners in the crowd. If he asks them to free their slaves, will they agree to it? Certainly not. It is only because they own the slaves. Just like that, he has bought and paid for Antonio's pound of flesh. He says that if the Duke refuses to give Antonio's flesh to him, the laws of Venice have no validity. He awaits justice. The Duke says he's inclined to dismiss the court unless Dr. Bellario, who is the legal expert he sent for to act as judge and help settle this matter, arrives that day. Salerio conveys that a messenger has arrived with letters from Bellario at Padua. The messenger is called in. The messenger is none other than Nerissa, disguised as the lawyer's clerk. Meanwhile, Bassanio cheers Antonio and says that he should be the one to die. Before Antonio loses a drop of blood, Bassanio would offer his flesh, blood, bones and everything. Antonio calls himself a sick sheep who deserves to die. He says that Bassanio has to live so that he can write Antonio's epitaph for his gravestone. Shylock sharpens his knife on the sole of his boot. When Bassanio asks him why he is eager to do so, he replies that he would cut the penalty from Antonio's body. Graciano is infuriated and says, Not on thy soul, but on thy soul, harsh Jew. Thou makest thy knife keen, but no metal can, no, not the hangman's axe, bear half the keenness of thy sharp envy. Can no prayers pierce thee? As Shylock and Graciano argue over whether Shylock is the soul of a murderous wolf reincarnated, the Duke gets around to reading the freshly delivered message. The letter is from Dr. Bellario, which says that he is sick. He is sending a young lawyer from Rome on his behalf. He is a young man with a mature head. He has been briefed on the situation and is prepared to act based on Dr. Bellario's opinion and his own learning. The Duke invites the young lawyer to enter the court. Portia, in the guise of a young lawyer, enters and is introduced to the court as the learned Dr. Balthazar. You are welcome. Take your place. Are you acquainted with the difference that holds this present question in the court? I am informed thoroughly of the cause, which is the merchant here. And which the Jew? Balthazar is all business and immediately asks Antonio if he admits to his oath with Shylock. Antonio does, and Balthazar says that Shylock must show mercy. Shylock demands to know why, and Balthazar explains that mercy is an attribute of God himself, and people should try to mirror God in their actions. The law is cold and precise. 
people should strive to be more than that. No one can gain salvation through the legal process, but through showing mercy. Since all of us pray for heavenly mercy, we must be willing to be merciful ourselves here on earth. Shylock disagrees and says he's here to see justice served according to the law. My deeds upon my head, I crave the law, the penalty, and forfeit of my bond. Balthazar asks Shylock whether Antonio can just pay off the debt, and Bassanio immediately offers to pay twice what's owed. In fact, he's willing to pay ten times the debt, and he offers his own life as the guarantee. Then he begs the Duke to step in, bend the rules, and save Antonio. Balthazar contradicts that bending the rules simply isn't an option. It would set a bad precedent. Shylock is very happy with the young lawyer. A Daniel come to judgment. Yea, a Daniel. O oh, wise young judge, how I do honor thee. Balthazar takes a look at Shylock's bond and declares that he has every legal right to what's owed to him because of Antonio's forfeit. Still, Balthazar asks Shylock to be merciful and suggests that he might forget the whole bond by accepting three times what he is owed. Shylock compliments Balthazar for his knowledge of the law, but again states that no man can move him. He wants the flesh. Antonio is tired of all this talk and would rather just get the whole darned thing over with. Balthazar asks Antonio to bear his chest and be prepared to go under the knife of Shylock because the law fully authorizes the penalty that has to be paid according to the contract. Shylock is overwhelmed with the decision of such a young lawyer. Tis very true, O wise and upright judge. How much more elder art thou than thy looks? Balthazar asks Shylock if he has scales to weigh the flesh, and he does. Shylock is thrilled that Balthazar is sticking to the wordings of the bond and making sure the flesh comes from near Antonio's heart. Balthazar asks Shylock if he has a surgeon ready nearby to stop the wounds of Antonio so that he doesn't bleed to death. Shylock informs that no such thing is written in the bond. Meanwhile, Antonio and Bassanio hold hands and share tearful goodbyes. Antonio consoles Bassanio and asks him not to be sad on his death. He further says that Lady Luck has been very nice to him because usually she makes the unhappy man live on to spend his old age in poverty. The misery has been avoided in this case. He asks Bassanio to share his story of death with his new wife Portia. Thus, she would know how much Antonio loved Bassanio. Antonio then instructs Bassanio only to be sad that he's losing a friend. Antonio himself does not regret paying Bassanio's debt to Shylock with his life. So Bassanio shouldn't either. Bassanio says that while his wife is as dear to him as his life, his wife, his life and the world put together are not worth more to him than Antonio. Antonio, I am married to a wife, which is as dear to me as life itself. But life itself, my wife, and all the world are not with me esteemed above thy life. I would lose all, I sacrifice them all here to this devil to deliver you. Balthazar wryly comments that if Bassanio's wife were around to hear this, she wouldn't be thrilled. Then Graciano offers up his wife too, adding that if she were dead and if she was in heaven, she would plead with some power to change Shylock's mind. Nerissa, disguised as Balthazar's attendant, mutters that if Graciano's wife were around to hear this, there'd be no peace in his household. Listening to their conversation, Shylock mocks that this is the way Christian husbands are and laments that his poor daughter is marrying a Christian. Balthazar gets back to the legal proceedings, laying out again the stipulations of the bond, 
The law gives up a pound of Antonio's flesh, and the law allows Shylock to cut it from Antonio's breast. Shylock is excited to lop off Antonio's flesh, but before he could start, Balthazar suddenly halts the process. He says, The bond allows for a pound of flesh, but no blood. If Shylock sheds a drop of Christian blood from Antonio, then the law of Venice states that Venice can confiscate his land, goods, and even kill him. Tarry a little, there is something else. This bond doth give thee here no jot of blood. The words expressly are, a pound of flesh. Take then thy bond, take thou thy pound of flesh. But in the cutting it, if thou dost shed one drop of Christian blood, thy lands and goods are by the laws of Venice confiscate unto the state of Venice. Is that the law? Thyself shalt see the act. For as thou urgest justice, be assured thou shalt have justice more than thou desirest. Shylock is stunned. Balthazar assures him that since he's been so intent on following the letter of the bond precisely, that's what they're going to do. Hearing this, Shylock is taken aback. He prefers to take three times the bond money and let the Christian go. But Balthazar insists this is no longer an option. Shylock had turned down the compromise when it was on the table. Shylock asks only for the principle of the debt, the 3,000 ducats, hoping for the whole affair to just be over with. Though Bassanio offers it up, Balthazar cuts him off again. Therefore, prepare thee to cut off the flesh. Shed thou no blood, nor cut thou less nor more, but just a pound of flesh. If thou takest more or less than a just pound, be it but so much, as makes it light or heavy in the substance, or the division of the twentieth part of one poor scruple, nay, if the scale do turn, but in the estimation of a hair, thou diest and all thy goods are confiscate. Shylock knows that he has lost the case. Give me my principle and let me go. Balthazar sternly reminds Shylock that he can only get the penalty at his own risk. He continues that there's another law that says if a foreign national seeks the life of a Venetian, either directly or indirectly, then the would-be victim gets half of his wealth and the other half goes to the state. The fate of the would-be murderer is in the hands of the duke. Balthazar encourages Shylock to ask the duke for mercy. The duke pardons Shylock's life before Shylock even asks for it. He declares that half of Shylock's wealth now belongs to Antonio and the state will be merciful to charge Shylock only a fine instead of taking the other half of his wealth. Shylock says if they take away his means of living, they may as well take his life. Nay, take my life and all, pardon not that. You take my house when you do take the prop that doth sustain my house. You take my life when you do take the means whereby I live. Balthazar asks Antonio what mercy he can offer Shylock. Antonio says that he'd like his half of the money to go to Lorenzo and Jessica, as long as Shylock does two things, convert to Christianity and draw up a will, leaving the rest of his wealth to Lorenzo and Jessica upon his death. The Duke likes all of Antonio's conditions and says that if Shylock doesn't accept them, he'll take back his pardon. Shylock, who is clearly getting the shaft left and right, has no choice left, agrees to every bit of it. Balthazar tries to get the clerk to write up the deed of gift to Jessica and Lorenzo. Shylock is disturbed and asks the Duke to allow him to leave the court. He asks the clerk to send the deed at home where he would sign them. The Duke allows him and he leaves. Everyone is very happy with the decision except Shylock. The Duke invites Balthazar to have dinner with him, but he diplomatically defers. He says he really has to be getting back to Padua. Bassanio approaches Balthazar to thank him 
and offers the 3,000 ducats which they had to give to Shylock earlier. Antonio adds that he loved Balthazar forever and ever. Balthazar thanks them, but says a job well done is enough reward for him. His thoughts were never on money. Still, he teases if they would even recognize him when they meet again. Bassanio requests to let him give him something. Dear sir, of course I must attempt you further. Take some remembrance of us as a tribute, not as a fee. Grant me two things, I pray you, not to deny me and to pardon me. Balthazar asks for Antonio's gloves, which he says he'll wear for his sake. From Bassanio, he asks for his ring. Bassanio hesitates, saying there's more to this ring than its monetary value. He offers to get Balthazar the most expensive ring in Venice instead, but Balthazar insists. Bassanio explains that his wife gave him the ring, and to give it away would be to break faith with her. Balthazar says that it is a common excuse for men who don't want to give away their stuff. He says that if his wife's not a mad woman, and he tells her how much Balthazar deserves this ring, she won't stay angry at him forever for giving the ring to him. Balthazar bids goodbye and leaves with his attendant. Antonio chastises Bassanio and suggests to give up the ring for the sake of Balthazar's hard work and his friendship. Bassanio asks Graciano to take the ring, give it to Balthazar, and invite him to Antonio's house, where he and Antonio will spend the night before heading back to Belmont in the morning. Go, Graciano, run and overtake him. Give him the ring and bring him, if thou canst, unto Antonio's house. Away, make haste. Portia and Nerissa, in the guise of Balthazar, and his attendant, continue to take care of the legal stuff. They will have to find Shylock's residence and get the deed signed by him. Inquire the Jew's house out, give him this deed, and let him sign it. We'll away tonight and be a day before our husband's home. This deed will be well welcome to Lorenzo. Graciano meets Balthazar and his attendant. He gives the ring to Balthazar. Balthazar accepts the ring given by Bassanio. Graciano invites them to dinner at Antonio's, but Balthazar declines it. That cannot be. His ring I do accept most thankfully, and so I pray you tell him. Furthermore, I pray you show my youth old Shalik's house. Nerissa, disguised as the attendant, whispers to Balthazar that she would try if Graciano gives her the ring. Portia, disguised as Balthazar, likes the idea. They'll get both rings and then crucify their husbands when they come home without them. I'll see if I can get my husband's ring, which I did make him swear to keep forever. Thou mayst, I warrant, we shall have old swearing that they did give the rings away to men, but we'll outface them and outswear them too. Away, make haste. Thou knowest where I will tarry. Graciano and the attendant clerk go in search of Shylock. Come, good sir, will you show me to this house? Lorenzo and Jessica, gazing at the beautiful night sky at Portia's residence in Belmont. They talk about Troilus weeping over Cressida, this be running away from a lion's shadow, Dido waiting for her lover, Medea gathering herbs for Jason, and Jessica running away with Lorenzo. Jessica teases that Lorenzo swore his love for her, but was full of lies, and Lorenzo jokes that she is slandering their love, but he forgives her for it. In such a night did Jessica steal from the wealthy Jew, and with an unthrift love did run from Venice as far as Belmont. In such a night, did young Lorenzo swear he loved her well, stealing her soul with many vows of faith, and ne'er a true one. 
Stefano, a servant, interrupts them to inform that Portia is on her way home. Jessica and Lorenzo decide they should go in and prepare the house for Portia. Lorenzo and Jessica are interrupted when Launcelot enters the scene and plays at his usual idiocy. The clown finally tells Lorenzo that he has a message to announce that Bassanio will be home before morning. Lorenzo, instead of preparing the house, changes his mind and he tells Stefano to bring some music outside. Lorenzo and Jessica go back to stargazing. How sweet the moonlight sleeps upon this bank. Here will we sit and let the sounds of music creep in our ears. Soft stillness and the night become the touches of sweet harmony, said Jessica. Look how the floor of heaven is thick and laid with patterns of bright gold. Lorenzo speaks sweetly to Jessica about the power of music and how she should never trust someone who isn't moved by it. Portia and Nerissa, who are getting close to home, are also philosophizing about music. Portia sees a burning candle in her house and marvels at how far its little light shines. That light we see is burning in my hall. How far that little candle throws his beams. So shines a good deed in a naughty world. When the moon shone, we did not see the candle. The two women then discuss some profound ideas, like how a candle is bright until you compare it to the moon, and how music, seemingly sweet during the day, is even sweeter at night, when everything's quiet and you can hear it better. Lorenzo hears Portia's voice, and they all greet each other. Portia reminds everyone that she and Nerissa were off praying for their husband's well-being. Lorenzo informs that the two men are on their way home, and Portia asks Nerissa to make sure none of the servants mention about their absence. She instructs Lorenzo and Jessica to keep quiet too. Go in, Nerissa. Give order to my servants that they take. No note at all for our being absent hence, nor you, Lorenzo, Jessica, nor you. A trumpet announces Bassanio's approach. Bassanio, Antonio, and Graciano enter, and there's much ado as Bassanio introduces Antonio to Portia, who welcomes him graciously. Sir, you're very welcome to our house. It must appear in other ways than words. Therefore, I scant this breathing courtesy. Off to the side, Graciano and Nerissa squabble. Portia turns her attention to the quarrel, and Graciano says Nerissa's only fussing is about a little ring. Nerissa, of course, points out that the ring isn't the issue. It's that Graciano had sworn to take the ring to his grave. Graciano, however, keeps insisting that he gave the ring to the young clerk who begged for it as a fee for his service. Portia backs up Nerissa. You were to blame. I must be plain with you. To part so slightly with your wife's first gift. A thing stuck on with oaths upon your finger and so riveted with faith unto your flesh. She points out that she also gave her husband a ring on the same promise that he would keep it forever. And of course, he wouldn't ever think of giving it away. Poor Bassanio is already shaking with fear. He thinks of cutting off his left hand and telling Portia that he has lost the ring defending it. Graciano informs that Bassanio had given the ring to the young lawyer. My lord Bassanio gave his ring away unto the judge that begged it and indeed deserved it too. And then the boy, his clerk, that took some pains in writing, he begged mine. And neither man nor master would take aught but the two rings. Portia pretends to be angry with Bassanio and says that she won't share a bed with Bassanio until she sees the ring. Nerissa makes the same threat to Graciano. Bassanio tries to cover up, saying Portia would be more forgiving if she knew the circumstances under which he gave the ring away. Sweet Portia, if you did know to whom I gave the ring, if you did know for whom I gave the ring, and would conceive for what I gave the ring, and how unwillingly I left the ring, when naught would be accepted but the ring, 
you would abate the strength of your displeasure. Portia responds that if he had known how worthy she was, he wouldn't have given it away at all. There's some squabbling about whether the ring was given to a woman. Bassanio tries to explain the whole thing. The 3,000 ducats, the lawyer, the seeming ungratefulness, etc. No, by my honor, madam, by my soul, no woman had it but a civil doctor, which did refuse 3,000 ducats of me and begged the ring, the which I did deny him and suffered him to go displeased away. Portia then says if the lawyer ever comes around her house, she'll have to share everything with him, since he's the one who now holds her oath in the form of the ring, which she had given to Bassanio. Antonio cuts off all the quarreling, having just barely escaped Shylock's knife. He's ready to risk his life again as a guarantee that Bassanio will, from this moment on, be faithful to Portia. I once did lend my body for his wealth, which but for him that had your husband's ring had quite miscarried. I dare be bound again, my soul upon the forfeit that your lord will never more break faith advisedly. Portia, hearing this, hands Antonio her ring to give to Bassanio, who must swear to take better care of it than he did to the last one. Bassanio is shocked to get the same ring back. By heaven, it is the same I gave the doctor. Portia says that she got it from the judge, and Nerissa confesses that she got the ring from the clerk. Graciano laments that he's been cheated on before he even deserved it, but then Portia clears everything up. She hands over a letter from the mysterious Dr. Bellario, who had written that Portia was the doctor of law at Shylock's trial, and Nerissa, the clerk. Further, Portia gives another good news to Antonio, that she has a letter which says that three of his ships have made it safely to harbor with merchandise. Antonio is speechless. Then everyone makes up. Antonio praises Portia for giving him his life and his work back with her good news. Sweet lady, you have given me life and living. For here I read for certain that my ships are safely come to road. Nerissa gives Lorenzo the good news that he and Jessica will get half of Shylock's fortune now, and the rest as an inheritance. Everyone is pretty impressed with the ladies. Portia says she's sure they still have questions, but those can wait till everyone is settled in. The play comes to an end with Graciano wondering, since it's so close to morning. He has to wait for another day to meet Nerissa. He decides that he'll keep her ring safe and thereby his oath in top priority. <laughs>